Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and this is the fourth video in my series called No Pathologies in Internal Family Systems. And this one is about schizophrenia. And someone requested that I make a video about schizoaffective disorder, which is essentially the symptoms that are included in schizophrenia, as well as bipolar or more mood disorders. And so you'll see that as I present it. But this is actually a pretty, as I was preparing this, I realized that it's so incredibly healing to me personally to talk about this um, because when I was 14, my first boyfriend, who was I believe was 17 or 18 at the time, um, was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And at the time, it was terrifying to me. I spent the rest of my high school years and some of my uh, college years absolutely terrified that I would get schizophrenia because that's the developmental time when many people... Um, <laughs> from an IFS lens, their parts begin to develop these strategies and these roles. Um, and so, but it was like the way that the current mental health system saw it, it was just this thing, this unpredictable thing that happened to a person and then it affected them for the rest of their life. There was no curing it. You just had to be institutionalized or fully medicated for the rest of your life. And you were a danger to yourself, to other people. And so it was quite traumatizing for me as a 14 year old to be so close to a person that I valued and cared for and was a very kind, loving, thoughtful person. And overnight, suddenly have this diagnosis and be put on all these medications and be institutionalized and say, suddenly now they're a menace to society or they're, you know, there's something really scary about them. They're crazy. And so I felt so sad and had so much grief for him. And like I said, I had terror for myself that lasted many, many years really until I found IFS. So the perspective that IFS has on this is so freeing <laughs> and, uh, very good news. So I'm excited to, to share this with you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I had some other experiences with people with schizophrenia as well that I might share. I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and just share my screen here and then do slideshow from, oops, from current slide. Okay, so just like we've talked about in all of the past videos, anything that has this label in honestly mental health or physical health is just basically you come to the doctor and you say, I have these symptoms, right? And you list them off and then they look at their manual and they say, ah, that's called you know, and they give you the label, the pathology, but really you came in there telling them what was happening. The problem for me is that it's as if you have this thing rather than acknowledging that these behaviors are symptoms of something deeper, of a root that can, we can actually go to and heal. It's often just said, oh, well, you just have this thing. You're going to live with it for the rest of your life we need to medicate you. Um, as you'll see, it's actually a cluster of parts that develop. So schizophrenia is characterized by reoccurring episodes of psychosis that are correlated with a general misperception of reality. And other common signs include hallucinations, typically hearing voices, delusions, which usually are paranoia, um, like a, a strong belief that other people are kind of out to get them uh, or conspiring to hurt them or kill them. And disorganized thinking, which is just another way of saying kind of irrational thinking. Uh, social withdrawal, because there's a fear that others are trying to hurt them in some way. 
and flat affect, which in my experience with people with schizophrenia really comes after they've been medicated. Um, a lot of medications will do that. They'll just basically take away all affect. And um, so there's this kind of appearance from the outside of just being very numb and flat. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some of these. So first of all, <laughs> when you say, you know, there's a misperception of reality, that's uh, assuming, okay, there's a, a general consensus of what reality is. I think sometimes people can be gaslighted. Uh, maybe they are seeing some very real problems in society and either another person or the culture in general gaslights them and says, no, that's not a problem. But they're actually just have a very sensitive system like the canary in the coal mine that that smells the toxic gas and other people say, we don't smell it. What are you talking about? And so sometimes maybe they really are seeing uh, something that is more real and the, and the culture is denying it. So that's a possibility. Um, and, but other times there are parts that are, again, seeing things that to other people are not there, right? So like these hallucinations, um, hearing voices, seeing things, um, kind of this conspiracy theories of believing that another person is out to get them when they really are not, right? But the thing to understand in parts is that these parts genuinely believe this. It's just like when we go in and we meet with any part, right? We can have a really young, you know, three-year-old part that believes genuinely that they are responsible for everything that happens in the world and that they're the center of the universe and their parents' um, emotions are their responsibility and their fault. And it's irrational. It's not true, right? But it's that young part still believes that. So in many ways, these might be very young parts that the person is stuck blended with a lot of the time because they are stuck in a moment of trauma. And this was the only way they knew how to protect themselves, right? So in many ways, you know, Dick Schwartz talks about how these parts are genuinely not in the present. They really are stuck back there. So when a schizophrenic person displays um, this paranoia, right, uh, the government's out to get me or this person or that person, um, we can get really curious about what happened to you. I think I say that in one of my points earlier, rather than taking it like, okay, you're ridiculous. This is not actually happening right now. And I guess we understand we need to update parts they may not actually be aware of what is happening right now. And they may really believe that they're in this past moment of trauma. And so it looks to us very irrational. And then people don't understand them, call them crazy, and they withdraw. And of course, that makes sense. And then, of course, I just want to repeat that because the person requested, I talk about schizoaffective disorder, that schizoaffective disorder is essentially just a combination of hallucinations, delusions, and, and then mood symptoms like depression and mania. So it's kind of you go in and you give a list of your symptoms and you've got both the ones on the list of schizophrenia and the ones on the list of bipolar. And so they say, you have schizoaffective disorder. <laughs> Again, it's it's uh, when you realize that it's actually that simple, that you're going in and you're giving these symptoms of these behaviors or um, you know things that are happening inside of you, and then the doctor's just regurgitating what they've decided that's called. Um, you're not necessarily learning anything new, except that the doctor will say, here's this medication usually for it. Um and I'll just make a point here about that. So when I was, uh, before I was married to my first husband, he had a roommate who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And this man also, like my first boyfriend, was a very gentle, kind person, uh, loved jazz music, had a whole jazz collection, uh, wonderful person, but was really plagued by 
this idea that other people were conspiring to hurt him and to kill him and believed that, you know, the police were doing that and different things like that. And so he was on medication. And again, in the, in the frame of the, the, you know, the general mental health understanding, I remember people saying this, oh, he's just, he's so rebellious. He won't take his medication. Why won't he take his medication? Um, doesn't he know that he's crazy without it kind of thing? And I, as I spent time with him, what I saw was that the medication took away everything that he was, um, all of his passions, his likes, his ability to feel empathy for other people. It took away everything from him. So the consequence for him of taking the medication was even greater than living with this uh, inner voices that were telling him that people were out to get him. And so th that's got to say something to us, right? We need to take people seriously about that. Uh, another little tangent, when I was an educational therapist and I worked with people with ADD, very similar situation that I observed. These people who were vibrant and energetic and um, talented in many, many ways would take this medication that would just completely suppress them, have no affect, no personality, so that they were essentially a robot that would would conform and comply with the society, with the teacher, with the parent, okay, you know, and I understood exactly why they didn't want to take that medication. Very similar in my experience with schizophrenia. Um, I do understand why um, some of these parts are extreme and can cause harm to a person and to other people. Again, not that these people are particularly violent and harmful, but because for all of us, when we have a, high, a lot of heightened fear, that's when we are the most dangerous often um, because we justify ourselves in protecting ourselves and perhaps um, perpetrating violence on someone else to protect ourselves. So I understand that it can be dangerous and I understand the use of medication. I'll show you something in a second about that, um, but it's not a long-term solution whatsoever. So as you can see, these symptoms are representative of parts that have developed in the person. Um, sometimes they might be protective parts that have learned that they have to be very hypervigilant or else something's going to happen. And you can ask them what happened. Other times it might be this panic of an actual exile who is in the moment of trauma and is really believes they're still in it. Okay, so like I said, from an IFS perspective, these are extreme protective parts who break off from quote unquote reality in order to protect parts that are stuck in unbearable trauma. Uh, so the greater the trauma, the more extreme the protective system. So when we see people with these extreme protectors or things that present a psychosis, right, break from reality, instead of fearing them and thinking, oh, they've got this scary disease, you know, just like we approach parts inside without fear and without judgment, we approach the parts inside of people like this and say, what happened to you? Why do you actually make sense? And I guarantee you that if you're open enough to hear the story, they will make sense. Like my, my uh, first boyfriend, I remember thinking it was crazy that these doctors thought that he was crazy when my experience with him was that his parents were um, highly controlling. They were kind of religious fanatics. They were, uh, you know, very regimented. I remember his father would, you know, whenever he showed any kind of emotion, his father would make him get down and give him 10 push ups or, um, so what I saw was this person who is at a developmental age where he's trying to produce strategies that will help him survive pretty severe trauma that he's grown up with, right? Um, okay, so deeper roots need to be looked at for sure. Yeah, it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And I'm going to get to the article 
by um, Iden, I believe, Goldman. It's really wonderful. But so yeah, get to the roots and not just the symptoms. So this it really, again, I feel like a broken record with these, but it's the same strategy as with everything in IFS where um, we get curious, we go inside, we ask the parts who might genuinely feel fearful or judgmental, can you give me space? And we go in and we listen to why these parts make sense and what happened to them, what they're protecting. And that's how we heal <laughs> anything in IFS. It's, it's always the same process, but the parts reveal unique things to us. So we have to really listen to them. Um, and then I am going to also make a note about unattached burdens at the end. I'm going to show you this article first. Okay, so let's see. Here is an article, and you can look this up if you want to. I, I encourage you to read the whole thing. It's called IFS, a non-pathologizing approach to mental illness, a personal journey. So it's about a person who received, uh, who's experiencing psychosis and received IFS therapy and what it looked like. So the introduction is just a general uh, about IFS. Um, so emotional wounds and negative beliefs are fragmented parts of the self or yeah, parts, um, which break away from their core at the time of wounding. They are the internalized beliefs and behaviors of one's original external family, surrogate family circumstance, and thus the name internal family system. Broken parts can individually and collectively block a person's ability to find and stay connected to his or her center or self. So they're describing this in some words that I wouldn't necessarily use. I wouldn't call them broken parts um, or even uh, fragmented parts, but but you get the idea that through trauma, parts have broken off. Um, then they really haven't broken off. They've taken on roles to help protect the person. But in essence, they block, I wouldn't even say connection to the self, but it, that's what it feels like, that they block the self energy from having leadership in the system, which looks like extreme behaviors, um, addictions, and can also include psychosis. Um, and then they talk about how when there's a severe intensity of trauma, that often there's this split into one or more separate additional systems of protection, a multiplicity of systems. So I'm going to come down here real quick to figure two. So down here, you can see that in everyone, we're all multiples. We have multiple parts within us. Um, for people who have very extreme trauma, and experience things like dissociative identity disorder or schizophrenia or bipolar, some of those things, they have systems within systems. Um, as I've worked with people, for, for example, that have DID, they've talked about how they have to have these ambassadors that go out to the system and then each system has self-like parts that communicate back to their self and so there becomes this uh, communication between the different systems and a gradual trust of bringing them in, back into one system. Um, but this is again, a protective strategy that the parts, people who have experienced extreme trauma develop in order to survive. Um, so they say, you know, the mental health field identifies the symptoms of these individuals in categories such as bipolar, psychotic, schizophrenic, based on observable speech and behavior patterns, patterns that diverge from what society generally agrees to as quote unquote normal. Again, this is what has been decided is or isn't normal. And, and then that adds more, you know, the, the, it's seen as malignant, it's seen as a pathology, and that creates shame and it creates more and more of a problem. Whereas if we see it as um, actually an adaptive approach to survive a, an immense trauma and that it makes sense, then we can really begin to understand it. 
So they say, seen from the viewpoint of the IFS model, these multiple sy systems are comprised of the same exiles, managers, and firefighters found in an average emotionally healthy single individual or system. Therefore, these parts are much less pathological than simply extreme with the true potential for healing and a return to self. Yes, yes, yes. So it's not pathological. It's extreme because the extremity of the trauma equals the extremity of the, the protective system. Um, and But there is hope and potential for healing. The individuals with extreme systems may or may not require institutionalization for protection from their own activated extreme parts or medication to sustain sufficient self-energy for a continuity of healing. Medication and or institutionalization can provide support, but need not necessarily be part of a lifetime treatment plan that holds no vision for transformation. Uh, I really just really wanted to make this point because it's not that institutionalization and medication don't have a place uh, when a person's protective system is so extreme that it's harming them or another person, but it's always just a, a bridge, a stepping stone to get to them to a balanced place where they can have some access to self energy with which to go to and heal the roots. It's not a lifelong sentence or lifelong treatment whatsoever. Um, and then they make this point here. Last thing I wanted to show is just that individuals with multiple systems may or may not be aware of their additional separate worlds, or they may cycle in and out of the awareness. That's just like all of us, right? Sometimes when we're blended with parts, we're not really aware of it. And, and then once we have the awareness, you're like, ah, you might have it after the fact, right? Or, and then begin having it during. So some exhibit, coming back up here, the behaviors of their so-called psychotic worlds, uh, while others assume behavior that looks normal by using managers or managerial systems that can mimic the qualities of self. So such self-like parts or systems protect wounded parts from painful exposure and create the appearance of external normalcy so the individual can function in the outer world. So sometimes people may even have some of this, what's considered psychotic. Oh, <laughs> celebrating that. Um, but they kind of keep it suppressed. They keep it under wraps. They just kind of suffer with it in silence. And they have really good managers that keep it away from the view of other people. And that can be seen as a good thing because they're able to kind of function, but they're really suffering inside. And then other people don't have kind of the managers to keep it down. It's seen and then other people fear them, shame them, think they're crazy, right? And then try to medicate them, et cetera. But if we see these symptoms, just like any emotion, right? I was taught that I had to suppress my emotion. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. I was taught that I had to suppress any and all emotions, right? My excitement, my uh, sadness, my anger, my anxiety, fear. But those are actually natural parts of me. And if they got extreme, it's because they were trying to alert me. There's a problem in front of you or inside of you that needs help. Just like if a person has a big addictive part or raging part, self-harming part, I understand coming at it and saying, this is a problem. It's having a negative impact that if we can't get curious and go toward it and say, why do you make sense? What are you alerting us to? What's the unmet need? What's the unhealed trauma here? Um, if we just try to suppress or escape it or shame it, we never get the valuable information that those really extreme parts are giving us. So it's the exact same thing with, these extreme symptoms of, of schizophrenia, of psychosis and, and delusion and hallucination and all of those things, we want to just get really, really curious. 
I wonder why this is presenting for this person. I wonder how it makes sense. I wonder how this part is trying to help them. And I guarantee that if we get curious, we will find out why. Um, and finally, um, I felt conflicted about this last point, but I really think it's important that I bring up the reality of what are called in IFS unattached burdens. Um, I have a part that doesn't want to include it because there's so much fear around unattached burdens, which, uh, you know, some people in religious settings will call demons or, you know, things like that, which um, creates a problem <laughs> because then what happens is people have these really fearful parts around it and um, unattached burdens feed off of fear and so then that just uh, exasperates the issue. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about unattached burdens in relationship to psychosis. Um, it can be easy to think that really big parts, extreme parts, right? Suicidal parts, self-harming parts, raging parts, um, parts that are out of touch with reality that have psychosis or delusion, paranoia, are likely not a part of us. They are something evil, right? Something outside. Um, so I would always, like, like Bob Falconer, who, who wrote the book on unattached burdens, would say, assume it's a part, assume it's a part, assume it's a part. Even if it is an unattached burden, we still treat it like a part. We it, This process of IFS still works. It's still the same. We still approach it with curiosity and compassion. So whether it's a big suicidal self-harming part inside or it's an unattached burden, um, we will have fearful parts of it, right? Because it's extreme. So if a person or if a part of us has psychosis or a person outside of us has a part that has psychosis, it makes sense that we have parts who are afraid right? So I'm not trying to diminish the parts that are afraid. They make complete sense. And I get their impulse to try to suppress, get rid of, diminish, deny, you know, um, because they're afraid. But then that keeps us from going toward with curiosity and getting to the root. So we have to ask our fearful parts to give us space, whether it's in our own system or we're a practitioner working with someone. Can you you know, go in another room, you can offer different things, or maybe one of the caretaking parts inside can take care of you in a safe space. I can hold your hand. You can go behind my back. When those fearful parts give us space, we naturally emerge. Our self is naturally courageous without fear, confident, curious, calm, um, in regard to these really big extreme parts or unattached burdens in our system. And then we can begin asking questions. So we ask questions to get to the good intention, to understand the history. What happened? What are you protecting? What are you afraid would happen if you didn't do this? That's the big question that where they will either point to another part that's extreme, that part would take over or they will point to the moment of trauma that another part may be stuck in that needs our help. So it's very, very valuable. In the case of an unattached burden, where it just continually does not, we continue to ask and ask, and it does not seem to have a good intention, um, then we might begin having the hypothesis, maybe this isn't a part of me. Maybe this is an energy that has come into me that is not mine, that is maybe from a perpetrator or from a loved one who died or from the collective unconscious in a sense, right? That has come in. And again, there may be parts who have fear around that about something coming in that's not ours. And I get that. I do get that. But like I've said in my, you can watch my video about unattached burdens and my experience. And there's nothing to fear. There really isn't because I think unattached burden is actually a misnomer because they really are attached. 
any energy that is not ours cannot stay in our system unless there are parts inside of us that want it to be there. So we just need to check, you know, say we, we ask and ask, and it just has no good intention. It just says, I just want to kill you. I just want to hurt you um, or the client, right? And it's repeatedly doesn't seem to have a good intention. We can say, okay, are there any parts in the system that want this to be here? And there might be a young vulnerable part that feels like this has power or protects them in some way. So it's still very similar to a protective part. And then the solution is our self or the client's self building a secure attachment with that part who has some kind of dependence or need for this unattached burden to be in the system. Once they are able to say, I don't need that anymore. I don't want it in the system. As soon as all of the parts in our system can say, we don't, we don't need it. We don't want it anymore. It has to go. And it's not some big, scary confrontation. It's just the self in its confidence and calm saying, you're not wanted here anymore. Would you like to go to the dark or to the light? But you've got to leave. Um, and so I hope that's I hope that's helpful. I would not assume that these big symptoms, extreme symptoms, necessarily are an unattached burden. But I want to say it because it is a possibility. I would always first go and assume that a person is experiencing this because they've had extreme trauma and so their system has developed extreme protectors and that it makes sense. Really try to get it how it makes sense. And if you are genuinely open and there's just no sense to be made, um, it still makes sense because there's still a part inside that believes that it needs to keep this um, energy that's not theirs. This is the same as a legacy burden, right? We may carry energy from our ancestors that's been passed down to us and it's not ours. And as soon as our system believes that it's safe to release it, it can be released. So an unattached burden is exactly the same thing. Um, and, and ironically, the parts who fear it, when they give space, there's nothing to fear. Um, so I've shared a lot, um, about my personal experiences with, with people with schizophrenia. I just, the biggest thing I want to reiterate with all of these pathologies is that there isn't anything to fear. If you go in with curiosity, you will, you will see that the person makes sense. There are parts that need to be witnessed, updated, reparented, brought into the present, unburdened. And when you deal with those roots, the symptoms will naturally release. Um, so essentially that quote unquote formula is the same for any and every part, extreme part in our systems. And so with these pathologies, it's the same. It's a same process and there's great hope in it. So if you have any questions um, or you want to share your experiences with me, I would love for you to do that in the comments below.